It's confusing. All right. Why is sleep important? We're going to be talking about all things sleep today. As you know, if you're a long-time listener of the show, then you know that I have my Swanee's blue light blocking glasses, which help, uh, help you sleep better. And I love to talk about sleep. Sleep is super important. None of us are getting enough of it. And today we're going to talk about ways that you can sleep better. And we're going to talk about Maybe sleep being the reason why you're carrying a few extra pounds or maybe you're a little bit stressed or maybe you don't have the love life that you want or maybe you aren't performing in the bedroom the way that you would like and uh, it might not be sexual dysfunction. It might just be because you're not sleeping very well. Sounds crazy, but it's true. And today we're going to be talking to a US Navy SEAL by the name of Dr. Kirk Parsley. And Dr. Parsley spent uh, much of his time serving as the undersea medical officer at Naval Special Warf Warfare Group One. So it's safe to say, given his credentials, that, uh, that Kirk knows what it takes to be fit, tough, and to get the job done. But he's also a sleep expert. He's been a member of the American Academy of Sleep Medicine since 2006. He served as Naval Special Warfare's expert on sleep medicine. And today he helps people achieve optimal health. Dr. Kirk Palsley, how are you, sir? Great to have you here. It's great to be here. Thanks. I'm doing quite well. Well, you're probably doing, do you're doing well because you slept well last night, right? Of course. I sleep well every night. How could <laughs> I have integrity otherwise? <laughs> Maybe once in a while I don't get enough sleep, but you know, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty good. Yeah. Uh, just before we get into some sleep habits here, Kirk, um, Navy SEAL, tell us a little bit about what what it was like being a Navy SEAL. Oh, I don't know how long's your show, man. <laughs> <laughs> um, at, you know, being a, being a Navy SEAL is probably you know the best time in my life, I guess, but. Um, it was, you know, it was my early twenties, which is probably the best time in any of our lives it for a lot of reasons. Uh, I mean, it was a great place to spend your twenties. Um, you know, I, I got, I got paid to do the stuff that everybody else was, was paying to go learn how to do. I mean, I, I was skydiving, I was rock climbing, I was scuba diving, I was, you know, whatever, racing around in dune buggies, driving off-road vehicles, blowing stuff up, shooting machine guns. You know, I, I was a SEAL during the Clinton administration, so it was different. You know, that's what we call the dry years. We kind of operated more like police officers than we did uh, any type of real military force. So, um, you know, those are, you know, kind of the Hollywood days, they call them, of the SEAL teams. And, um, you know, it was, it was a lot of fun. I mean, obviously, it's really hard work, and it's really hard training to get into, and uh, it's even harder <laughs> – once you become a SEAL, you, I mean, everybody thinks the SEAL training is, is the tough part, but uh, it, the job's a lot harder than the training was. So, um, But yeah, I mean, it, it, was, it was a great time. You've seen that movie with Demi Moore, G.I. Jane, back from the 90s, you know, where, where she's the... <laughs> Unfortunately, I have, yeah. <laughs> and she, she goes through as the only woman trying to, you know, get through Hell Week, which is this very famous week where they, they put you through hell, right, to try and get... Don't sleep for a week. <laughs> you don't sleep for a week, and ironically, I become a sleep doctor, right? So, uh, and how yeah. rea how realistic is that when you see you know, hell? Very good. When you see Hell Week portrayed in Hollywood movies like GI Jane and other things like that, how realistic realistic is that? Well, I mean, there's there's not much as realistic or uh, about any of the uh, about Hollywood in general, obviously um, I'd say act of valor is probably the most realistic seal movie. And that's because almost all the actors in it are seals. Um, but you know, there was, there was definitely some um, creative liberties taken with that movie as well. Um, but uh, you know, hell week. Uh, I mean, I, I think it's been, I mean, it's been a long time since I saw GI Jane. I saw it whenever it was out. So I, not something I will. Uh, I, it, it's uh, it's probably uh, one of the least accurate. Um, 
I, I just got something to say our connection's unstable. Um, uh, hold on. Uh, I have you back now, I think. No? Yep, I got you there. Let's carry on. Oh, yep. Okay. Yep. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think I remember correctly that uh, she was, uh, you know, she was kind of this, this lone wolf and everybody was, everybody hated her and everyone was trying to break her and she beat, and she beat everyone like that, that shit doesn't happen. Like there's no way. I mean, it's, it's definitely an organization where if, if they hate you, you aren't going to make it through training. That's kind of the way, uh, it's kind of the way it's set up because it's a team effort. You know, is there really a bell there that you have to go and ring the bell if you're going to yeah. quit? I mean, not, not for the first few days. And then after that, you're just, you're so cognitively out of it. Um, it's, <laughs> I guess staying sane and staying, uh, cognitively able to follow instructions. I mean, you got people hallucinating and running off in all different directions and, you know, it's kind of a mess. Once you keep, once you keep people up for about 72 hours, um, they're pretty useless, especially since, especially since you're just like doing physical activities all day, every day. I mean, from the time it starts to the time you stop, it's just the only time you're resting is when you're eating and you know, the mm. rest of the time you're running, paddling, swimming, you know, mm. dig, digging huge ditches on the beach with paddles, you know, just you know, silly stuff to mm. you know, get guys keep. And how long did you go with sleep deprivation when you were doing any of the stuff that you were doing with the Navy SEALs, Kirk? I think I've lost you. You're frozen. Why is it? Okay, well, uh, let's have a look here. So, Kirk, what was the longest time you went with sleep deprivation, either during Hell Week or when you were a Navy SEAL? And what, what happened to you and to your body when that happened? Well, uh, depends on what you mean by sleep deprivation. You mean complete absence of sleep yeah, or well, just not enough ev sleep? Everything. To give us the absence and not enough. Uh, so the longest I've ever stayed awake uh, is, is during Hell Week. And, you know, you, you doze off here and there. So I can't say that I absolutely never slept during that week, but there's no time allocated for sleep. So you might fall asleep underneath your boat or something for a few minutes or something like that. But, um, so that's, uh, from, let's see, Sunday, Sunday evening or Sunday afternoon, they start, um, of course you've been up since Sunday morning and then, uh, you're awake until Friday afternoon. Um, and it, like I said, super physical, lots of harassment sort of to keep you awake uh not really falling asleep isn't really an option unless uh the instructors aren't around um, which was very minimal um now the longest i've gone without adequate sleep is about 15 years <laughs> <laughs> so probably starting right around that hell week time uh a little bit before uh well probably even before that i mean it just the military in general is is uh, an organization that doesn't really value sleep. I mean, I probably chose the worst two professions, right? Being a Navy SEAL and then being a doctor. Neither one of those, neither one of those uh, professions really value sleep, and they're they're very bad at uh, at uh, regulating sleep. Um, mm. Yeah, so I would I'd say uh, you know during Hell Week that was a short duration. I was young. I mean, I was 19 years old when I went through SEAL training, so I was still made of rubber. I could do anything. Um, but you know, I I went from you know being a SEAL. I was in I was in the military for six years. I got out, went to college, worked, had kids, was married while I was going through college. So, um, you know, working and having a family and going to college full time, trying to get into medical school. You can imagine how much I slept. Um, you know, forty five hours was probably a good night. Uh, got to medical school, kind of the same thing. Slept about. Um, uh, and uh, then we got into I, I got into another phase of training after that when I was doing the undersea medic and med medical school training where I actually had or the undersea medicine training where I actually had a chance to get some sleep and um, you know I thought I'd, I don't know I just thought I was kind of getting old but I mean I was losing my hair I was forgetful I was uh, had a lot of anxiety actually I mean that's one of the biggest uh, side effects of uh, sleep deprivation is anxiety um, for, 
for very obvious reasons. Once you learn the physiology of sleep, um, I mean, bad body composition, bad athletic performance, you name it. I mean, there, there's, there's nothing that sleep doesn't sleep deprivation doesn't make you worse at. And there's nothing that uh, sleeping well doesn't make you better at. Mm. And uh, as I understand it, um, we're sleeping about 20% less than what we slept about 30 years ago. And I think we're sleeping like four hours less a night than what we were sleeping 200 years ago. So how, how has this happened? Like, how are we progressively like did not taking our sleep seriously, I guess? Yeah. Well, I mean, there, we get into heavy philosophical, uh, unsubstantiated, unsubstantiated and unsubstantiable uh, claims here at this point. But um, I, I I mean, I think it makes good sense uh, that <clears throat> sleep deprivation started along the time of industrialization um, and rural electrification, right? So uh, before you had lights at night, it was pretty hard to, you know, to do anything at night. And so we used the sun as our cue. Once we had electric uh, light bulbs and uh, you know, around that same time is when, it, at least in America, that's when it was like, uh, uh, you know, Ford was building his motor plants and, and you know, we had the railroads and all we, we had all this industry where people could work shifts and time became money. And, you know, if you could work a few more hours, you could make a few more nickels. And if you could make a few more nickels, you could buy, you know, a few more loaves of bread or whatever. Um, and the, in those days and, uh, yeah, I mean, once time, once time became money, it became the first thing that people gave up to get money, which is ironic, you know, <laughs> because, uh, you know, their sleep began the first thing they, um, because, you know, they, uh, everybody equates, well, it's only waking time that's money. Well, no, it's sleeping time that's money as well. And in fact, I'd make the argument that the sleeping time is uh, more lucrative than the, than the waking time. Yeah. They've done, they've done studies that show that people who sleep consistently well make more money than those who don't. Yeah. It's, yeah. uh, if you're trying to convince people of the merits of, cause there's, there seems to be this whole idea in modern society, which is like, um, push through, don't sleep, be the entrepreneur. Who's like, you know, burning the midnight oil, so to speak. There's, there are songs, you know, I'll sleep when I'm dead. Right. And, um, you know, I'll live while I'm alive. I'll sleep while I'm dead. I'm going to go and party. You only live once, you know, right. um, because you only live once you should stay out till three or four in the morning. Um, and then, you know, get a few hours and then just get up and just go again. I mean, that's the, that's the way to do it, right? Like that's, that's, that's really getting the most out of life, isn't it, Kirk? Yeah. I, uh, I mean, the, the fallacy there, of course, is that sleep isn't good life. <laughs> um, <laughs> right. I mean, it, if you, uh, I mean, you, you could get really esoteric with it and talk about, um, you know, you can talk about dreams. Mm -hmm. Uh, I lost you. I still got you. Don't worry. I'm just, I'm just, yeah, improve, making sure that our Wi-Fi connection is as good as possible. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah I mean, you can make the argument that, uh, you know, that you know, dreams are, are, you know, like plant medicine or something. It's like, you know, it's like perhaps uh, access to other parts of, of uh, consciousness that you're not consciously aware of when you're awake. Uh, that's that's a little airy and foo foo, but um, it. I mean it if you think of it in, in logical terms, um, everybody wants to get better, right? We're entrepreneurs because we want to be better at what we do. Like, you know, we, we have some sort of passion. We want to get that message out to other people. We want to get our product out to other people. We want to get our service out to other people, whatever it is. Um, and, and you know, as well as I do, your job's never done as an entrepreneur. You know, or you have a hundred million things to do. You might check three off your list a day. So when do you stop? Like when you're exhausted is when you stop, right? Um, that's how everybody approaches it. Um, but, you know, you're trying to get better at running your business and getting your message out there. And, you know, all the things that you do, you want to be better at. You want to be more efficient at it. When are you getting better at that? Yeah, it's when you're sleeping, right? It's when you're sleeping. That's the only time you're getting better. Yeah. Yeah. When you work out, you don't get stronger when you work out. You get weaker. You tear your body up when you mm. when you work out. You damage it. When the, when the tissue repairs itself, it comes back stronger. And if you're lifting heavy weights, it comes back able to lift heavier weight. And if you're an endurance athlete, it comes back able to do more enduring activities. If you're an entrepreneur and you're trying to learn a new skill and you want to <clears throat> bury that into your, you know, something as simple as, you know, you went to, uh, 
marketing course and like you're going to, you know, you have a new elevator pitch or you have like a new slant to your marketing message, the way you're going to integrate that into your brain and the way you're going to, um, you know, tie that into what you already know and what you've already done and come up with the most successful utilization of that new skill is while you're asleep. You might practice it during the day, but you're mm. going to actually get better at it while you sleep. Right. That's been proven. You can prove it with naps because you can insert naps in between, in between training activities, anything, and people actually improve about two to three times as fast. Yeah. It's, um, it's kind of insane, isn't it? Like all the studies that show that sleep gives you the optimum life. It's, it's kind of like the people who say, well, you know, sleep when you're dead and you know, I'll just, uh, I'll get the most out of life. It's really comes down to like the quality of your life. Doesn't it? Like if right, you, right. so you might be saying, well, you know, I'm, I'm increasing the quantity of hours that I'm actually awake and therefore getting amazing experiences out of life. Right. But the quality is going to be compromised of your life. Yeah. So <clears throat> Try to make that argument with saying um, you're going to reduce your anx your anxiety, uh, the uncertainty of being an entrepreneur by being drunk all day. Um, I don't think anybody would consider that a logical argument, right? Right. However, that's pretty much what sleep deprivation is. I mean, there's lots of studies uh, where they equate sleep deprivation to impairment um, on par with section such alcohol level. Obviously not, you're obviously not drunk, but you're performing as though you were drunk. So it's like a 0.05, right? 0 0.05 alcohol well, that, level. That's just, that's, a, that's being awake 17 hours. So being wow. awake 17 hours straight, mm. which is normal, fairly normal for everybody, right? Um, that's 0 0.05. If you miss two hours of sleep, so most people need about eight hours of sleep. If you're working out or working extra hard, you might need slightly more, but you know, it's seven and a half hours, plus or minus half an hour. Most people average out around eight. If you're sleeping six hours a night, you do that for 11 hours or 11 days in a row. You perform exactly as though you haven't slept for 24 hours, which is about a 0 0.08 to 0 0.1 blood alcohol level. If you do that for 22, 22 days in a row, then you start performing as though you haven't slept for two days, which is like about a 0.15 to a 0.2 blood alcohol level. That's your performance level. And just like a drunk person doesn't know they're drunk, a sleep deprived person will argue with you that they're not sleep deprived. They'll say, well, I've told, I'm totally used to this. I've been doing this for you know, so long, I'm totally adapted to this schedule. Mm. Um, it's not until you get them to sleep, it's just like you, it's not until the drunk guy becomes sober does he realize he was drunk. It's not until the sleep deprived person gets that pays back their sleep debt that they go, Oh my god, like the world is so much more fun, the colors are so much brighter. And if, if you're really trying to get everything you can out of life, it's the experience out of life that you want, right? Yeah, if you're drunk, are you getting the full experience? Hell no. If you're sleep deprived, you're not getting the full experience either. The colors aren't as bright. The emotions aren't as rich. The, you know, the successes and, and you know, the successes aren't as high and the failures aren't as deep. I mean, you're, it flattens emotion. It flattens emotional stability. It flattens your ambition. It flattens everything cognitively. We're talking to Dr. Kirk Parsley and uh, Dr. Parsley is actually the creator of an amazing sleep remedy, which I, uh, I take regularly myself. It's actually pretty delicious as well. Uh, it's called Doc Parsley Sleep Remedy. It's a little satchel that you can pour into uh, a nice warm glass of uh, water at the end of the night. Uh, and you can check that out at docparsley.com. That's D O C. P A R S L E Y dot com. We'll talk a little bit about his his uh, sleep cocktail cocktail in a second. Um, so let's get into now some some practical things, Kirk. That uh, that our listener and our viewer here can actually implement in their life to sleep better. Now we know that it's like her, poor sleep is horrendous for us. Right. What are some? What are, what are? I guess what are the things that um, what are some of the things that we can do to improve our sleep? Well, interestingly, you know, most of my private clients are entrepreneurs. Um, and it's really 
uh, surprising to me that <laughs> the hardest thing that I do when I, when I work with people to optimize their performance, I don't just work with around sleep. I do sleep, nutrition, exercise, stress mitigation, and mindset. But um, the sleep is the hardest part <laughs> to convince people to do. Uh, I mean, I can tell them to eat kale for every meal and exercise three hours a day and meditate three hours a day and they're fine with it. But as soon as I tell them to sleep eight hours a night, they're like, oh, no, no, I don't have time to do that. <laughs> um, so I would say the number one thing in getting good sleep is convincing yourself that you really need sleep. Um, mm. That's the way to convince yourself that you really need sleep is to get really good sleep for a week mm. and then see how you feel. And you'll realize that you feel a hell of a lot better. Life is a lot better. All of your problems don't seem nearly as problematic. All of your weaknesses don't seem nearly as hamstringing as, mm. uh, as, all, as it was when you're sleep deprived. Um, so that's the number one thing. The number two thing, it, it, probably stuff you've talked about uh, on your podcast a billion times is the sleep hygiene aspect. And rather than go through the list of, you know, making a completely dark room and getting rid of electronics and, you know, decreasing the photo period and wearing your cool glasses uh, at night and all, all those things, I break it down into two things, right? If you look at how we evolved, the way we evolved was to use the sun as our cue is when to be awake and when to be asleep period, right? I, you can't get around that. Evolution isn't going to change fast enough for us to escape that. Quick enough uh, to be healthy in the lifestyle that we're living. So <clears throat> we also can't get people to go back into the caves and wear loincloths and recreate, um, you know, paleolithic uh, time period or something. So it's important to just understand what sleep, what sleep hygiene is aiming to do. So when the sun goes down, the blue light goes down, as you, I'm sure you talk about all the time, blue light decreases in the retinal ganglia. That signals the brain. That starts a whole cascade of events. One of those events is the production of melatonin, which decreases stress hormones. Uh, stress hormones keep us awake. Not, they're not just making us stress. They're keeping us awake in proportion to our environment. And another thing it does is it increases GABA in the brain and GABA then slows down the neocortex and the neocortex is what we think of when we think of the human brain, that picture of like the, you know, wrinkly, squiggly, gray, right. grayish tan sort of mass part, right. that part needs to slow down. That's how we interact with the world. That's how we perceive the world. That's how we, you know, that's how we move. That's how we, mm -hmm. you know, that's how we smell, that's how we touch and um, maybe not smell technically, um, but that's how we interact with the world. So we have to slow down that and we have to decrease the light in our eyes. So your glasses are a great example of how you decrease the light in your eyes. Okay. You decrease, I'll yeah. put the glasses on here. There we go. There you go. You your cool glasses. Um, you, you, do, you do that to keep the blue light out of your eyes because these retinal ganglia that start this process are only sensitive to blue, to blue light and not the full spectrum. So you can, you know, if you want to use the word hack, I hate the word hack, <laughs> biohacking. Um, and the only reason I hate it is because I, I feel like the original biohackers were the pharmaceutical industry uh, and I'm, I'm pretty anti-pharma. So, uh, you know, you can do that. You can put all the stuff on your computer, you know, the flux on your computer, or the, you know, you can put the right kind of light bulbs in your house that don't have blue spectrum, whatever, however you want to decrease the light in your eyes. But then you also have to slow your brain down. So just because you put on your glasses and have F flux on your computer does. Work like that either. You have to slow your brain. With that, with those two bits of information, I, I, if I you know, put you in a room by yourself, gave you those two, two, two bits of information and said, write me a plan for going to sleep, what do you reckon that would look like? Yeah, people, people wouldn't, uh, wouldn't want to pay you for your advice, that's for sure. <laughs> exactly, right? Because if, you, if you've ever had kids or if you've ever been a kid, remember there was this protracted getting ready for bed period. Right. Yeah. What was that about? Yeah. What you want to watch? You want to watch? Yeah, that was about slowing down, slowing down these really active brains. These kids were like trying to settle them down. That's what story time's about. That's what the, you know, that's what the bath time is about. The, you know, the baths dropping their body temperature a little bit, which is again, you know, one of sort of the normal, one of the normal cues, which you can do as part of your sleep hygiene. But you can go online and look up sleep hygiene. Um, but you know, we 
we get kids ready for bed hours before they're going to go to bed if we want them to actually go to bed. We need the same thing. If you look at hunter gatherers um, <clears throat> who are, you know, still live that lifestyle today, have never been exposed to electricity, it takes them about three to three and a half hours to fall asleep after the sun goes down. Nobody's going to spend three hours getting ready for bed in America and Australia and Europe and all that stuff. Um, but, um, yeah, you know, that would be the ideal. So we use these little tricks to decrease the light and decrease our stimulation and give ourselves at least a solid hour. And then that really, that's all my supplement is. So we can completely mm. tie that in and make that like a really short packaged deal is that all my supplement does is concentrate all those things in your brain that your brain would have ordinarily concentrated over the course of three hours. I do it in 30 minutes. Um, but then it's all out of your bloodstream within about three hours. Your brain has to keep mm. the cascades going, mm. which is the whole purpose of the way I, the reason I made it the way I did. Yeah. So, so if in doubt, then, uh, when you wake up in the morning, go and get natural sunlight as soon as possible because you want to set your circadian rhythm in motion. So you, your body knows, yes, it's daytime. And then when the sun goes down at nighttime, try to limit blue light exposure as much as possible from your computers, electronics, um, and, and this concoction that you have created, Kirk, um, which is Doc Parsley Sleep Remedy, um, which is designed to calm the brain down. It's kind of like a three-hour uh, calming of the brain down, but in 30 minutes. Is that right? Yeah, essentially. That's it. Yeah. And, it and it starts that initial cascade towards... Um, towards melatonin production. So I know uh, in Australia, you don't have uh, Thanksgiving, but over here, you know, we have Thanksgiving and our tradition around Thanksgiving is really just that we overeat. Um, there's really nothing else to it. Other than, I guess we overeat with our families. Um, but, uh, you know, over here, there's something called the tryptophan coma. Everybody knows about after you eat a bunch of turkey, you fall asleep on the couch and everybody blames it on the tryptophan and the turkey. It's not that turkey meat has any excessive amount of tryptophan, and it's just the only meat that we tend to overeat. I mean, people don't usually sit down and eat two pounds of steak. For some reason, you eat two pounds of turkey. Um, you know, the the pathway to produce melatonin is tryptophan, 5 hydroxy tryptophan, serotonin, and then melatonin. And so you're just front loading with some tryptophan, yeah, with some tryptophan, this, and then 5 hydroxy tryptophan. And so we're putting that in there. For 5-HTP to become serotonin, you need vitamin D3 and magnesium, so that's in the supplement. And then there's a little bit of melatonin just because your brain would have made a little bit of melatonin by that three-hour mark. There's about that much in there, or a little bit more than that because you want to absorb uh, all of it. Uh, and it just initiates everything. And then it has the gap, of course, that can cross the blood-brain barrier, which is the other thing that builds up to slow down the brain. One of the questions I always get um, about uh, is about melatonin. They're always like, oh, should I take those melatonin supplements, you know, yeah. with five milligrams, 10 milligrams, two milligrams. One of the things I noticed in your supplement is that you have micro amounts in there. And in yeah. fact, in, in a supplement that we've just brought out as well, it's the same thing, micro amounts of, of, uh, of melatonin. Can you just explain why this idea that we should pump ourselves full of, you know, um, supplement melatonin is is actually maybe doing us more harm than good yeah i mean you know wouldn't you know as i was saying earlier i mean my my sort of real profession is optimizing performance um and i i do that by sort of optimizing everything within normal physiologic amounts so once you go outside of normal physiologic amounts of anything all, all bets are off i don't really know what's going to happen um so it's important to realize that from the time the sun goes down until the sun, time the sun comes up, your brain is only going to make about, you know, five, six, maybe up to eight micrograms of melatonin total over a 12 hour period or 14 hour period, depending on the season. Um, so if you take a five milligram melatonin, you know, you can do the math. That's a hell of a lot more and you're getting it all sort of at once. Um, it does, it's not all going into your brain, but it's affecting, you know, your, your gut brain as well. And that's where some of the anxiolytic effects and so forth come from. But melatonin is of course a hormone. And what we know about hormones is that when you give exogenous hormones, meaning you take it from the outside and put it into your body, when we give people hormones, they tend to stop producing those hormones because your, 
your body's a smart machine, right? Like, why is it going to make something it doesn't have to make? If it's getting it for free, your body's going to quit making it. We haven't been able to substantiate that with melatonin. Um, and I think that, I mean, there's various reasons why I think that's true. But what we have substantiated is that the receptors for melatonin that, that matter, right? The receptors on the cell that are bringing the melatonin into the cell and actually making that melatonin useful, those do decrease when you take you know, take more melatonin than your body would ordinarily produce, you decrease those receptors. Now, if you take that away, you don't have as many, you don't have enough receptors. So even though you're, even if you're still producing a normal amount of, a uh, normal physiological amount of melatonin, you don't have enough receptors to pick it all up. And so your body sees that as a, as a deficit. And so now you've created a hormone imbalance. Um, and you can't just affect one hormone, <laughs> the body, you know, the, the first thing to know about medicine is that we don't know anything. <laughs> uh, what we think we know is, you know, half of it's wrong. And we only know, we only think we know about one, one millionth of what's going on at any time anyway. So, you know, so there's thousands of hormones and, you know, we, if you take all the intermediates, uh, and there, there's thousands of hormones circulating around that are affecting every aspect of your health, man. It's affecting our blood pressure right now. It's affecting how fast we're breathing. It's affecting our cognition. It's affecting everything. Um, our ability to recover and grow and fight off infection. Like all this stuff is, you know, driven by hormones. Um, and so I just, I don't think it's a smart idea to go super physiologic on anything. Um, and, you know, just because somebody feels good on it uh, doesn't make it a good idea. I mean, if I, if I gave you, you know, cocaine every day, you'd probably feel pretty good on that too, but it doesn't make it a smart idea. What about people who are taking prescription sleep medicines like Xanax, Val Valium, yeah. what are those things? What are your thoughts on those ones? Well, <laughs> thoughts on those, that's a really bad idea. Um, without going, without getting too geeky on the science of it, it's a really bad idea because when you are under the influence of those drugs, you are not sleeping. You are unconscious, which is completely different than being asleep. Um, so when we do a sleep study, we can predict sort of neuronal patterns in the brain. And when we see these certain things happen in these neuronal pa patterns of the brain, we can say you're in stage one, two, three, four, or REM sleep. And some people call that now stage five sleep. Um, if you aren't sort of in the normal pattern of that and having normal sleep cycles, you aren't getting the real benefit of sleep. And so, you know, the, the original drugs and, and what those do, what those drugs do is they act like GABA. And we just talked about melatonin overdosing causing problems. Well, GABA overdosing causes problems as well. And so these drugs aren't GABA drugs, uh, you know, Valium and Valium and Xanax are not, they're not GABA. They're just molecules that bind to GABA receptors and they have about a thousand to 10,000 times more effect than GABA does. And so it slows down your brain and it decreases your interaction, which as you remember is one part of the equation that we talked about. Uh, but it binds so tightly and it has such a profound effect on your brain that it gets rid of that normal sleep architecture. Um, and the, so they came out with these Z drugs that bind, you know, they bind more specifically to certain GABA receptors and they think it makes it better. Um, but the Z drugs block more of the REM sleep and the, um, you know, the first generation um, benzodiazepines like Valium and, and uh, Xanax, they block more of the, of the deep sleep. They both block both. Uh, they both interfere with both uh, deep. And alcohol decreases stages three and four sleep. Uh, over the counter stuff like antihistamines um, pretty equally decreases sleep, uh, deep sleep and REM sleep. All right, so there we go. Dr. Kirk Parsley, former U.S. Navy SEAL, now a sleep doctor and, and uh, health expert. Uh, and if you haven't already checked out uh, Dr. Kirk Parsley's TEDx talk, you can uh, do a search for him. He did a TEDx talk on sleep. And uh, his website is docparsley.com, D-O-C-P-A-R-S-L-E-Y.com. And I can personally vouch for his Doc Parsley's sleep remedy concoction, uh, which uh, sometimes I even go a little bit hardcore, uh, Kirk, and I, I don't put it in water and I just like open up, <laughs> yeah, 
I open, up, I open up the satchel and I just throw it in and it gives me, it's kind of like, it tastes like a, like, um, like a sugar hit, like, like one of those old pieces, old lollies back in Australia or like candy or whatever, where, where it's kind of like a, like a, almost like a sour, um, candy. And it's like, it gives you like an aftertaste, but it tastes really good, but it also like <laughs> just, just makes you, your head feel like it's in a vice at the same time. It's kind of like, Oh, it hurts so good. It hurts so good. You know what I mean? <laughs> I've never tried that. It sounds like a, uh, a pixie stick, what we'd call a pixie stick. That you, you um, never tried that. See, there you go. One I, of your. I've never what, tried it. I'll, I'll give it a shot. I'll do it tonight. Yeah. One of your customers is uh, is experimenting with it. There you go. That's me, James yeah, Swanick. I'm, I'm sure there's people snorting it. Uh, you know, I mean, who knows, who knows <laughs> what else is going on with it? Yeah. So there you go. So Doc Puzzy, thank you so much for your time and bringing your expertise to our. Uh, this is anywhere else we can connect with you, or did I get that right in terms of Doc Parsley? Yeah, I mean, uh, I'm, I'm the same on social media. It's all it's all Doc Parsley. There might be some Kirk Parsley stuff, but you can find all that on my website too. Beautiful. Well, Doc Parsley, thank you so much for your time. I appreciate your expertise. All right. Thanks and, for having me on. And to you, the listener and the viewer, thank you for listening, and I'll catch you on the next one.